Chapter Three of the Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins, Volume One. The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins, by Robert Paltick, Chapter Three. I was now near nineteen years of age, and though I had so much more in my head than my school learning, I know not how it happened. But ever since the commencement of my amour with Patty, having somebody to disburden my mind to and to participate in my concerns, I had been much easier and had kept true tally with my book, with more than usual delight. And being arrived to an age to comprehend what I heard and read, I could, from the general idea I had of things, form a pretty regular piece of Latin without being able to repeat the very rules it was done by. So that I had the acknowledgment of my master for the best capacity he ever had under his tuition. This, he not sparing frequently to mention it before me, was the acutest spur he could have applied to my industry. And now, having his good will, I began to disuse set hours of exercise, but at my conveniency applied myself to my studies as best I pleased, being always sure to perform as much or more. Then he ever enjoined me, till I grew exceedingly in his confidence, and by reason of my age, though I was but small, yet manly, I became rather his companion upon parties than his direct pupil. It was upon one of these parties I took the opportunity to declare the dissatisfaction I had at my mother's second marriage. Sir, says I, surely I was of age to have known it first. Especially considering the affection my mother had always shown to me, and my never having once done the least thing to disoblige her. But, sir, said I, something else I fear is intended by my mother's silence to me, for I have never received above three letters from her since I came here, which is now, you know, three years, and those were within the first three months. I then showed him the forementioned letter I received from my new father in law. And assured him that gave me the first hint of this second marriage. I found by the attention my master gave to my relation, he seemed to suspect this marriage would prove detrimental to me. But not on the sudden knowing what to say to it, he told me he would consider of it, and by all means advised me to write a very obliging letter to my new father, with my humble request that he would please to order me home the next recess of our learning. I did so under my master's dictation, and not long after received an answer to the following effect: "Son Peter, your mother has been dead a good while, and as to your request, it will be only expensive and of little use, for a person who must live by his studies can't apply to them too closely." This letter, if I had a little hope left, quite subdued my fortitude and well nigh reduced me to clay. However, with tears in my eyes, I showed it to my master, who, good man, wishing me well, Peter says he, "What can this mean? Here is some mystery concealed in it. Here is some ill design on foot." Then, taking the letter into his hand, "A person who must live by his studies," says he, "here is more meant than we can think for." Why have not you a pretty estate to live upon when it comes to your hands, Peter? Says he. I would advise you to go to your father and inquire how your affairs are left, but I am afraid to let you go alone, and will, when my students depart at Christmas, accompany you myself with all my heart, for you must know I have advised on your affair already, and find you are of age to choose yourself a guardian. Who may be any relation or friend you can confide in, and may see you have justice done you. I immediately thanked him for the hint, and begged him to accept of the trust as my only friend, having very few, if any, near relations. This he with great readiness complied with, and was admitted accordingly. So soon as our scholars were gone home, my master lending me a horse. We set out together to possess ourselves of all my father's real estate, and such part of the personal as he had been advised would belong to me. Well, we arrived at the old house, but were not received with such extraordinary tokens of friendship 
as would give the least room to suppose we were welcome. For my part, all I said or could say was that I was very sorry for my mother's death. My father replied, so was he. Here we paused, and might have sat silent till this time for me, if my master, a grave man who had seen the world, and was unwilling any part of our time there, which we guessed would be short, should be lost, had not broke silence. Mr. G., says he, I see the loss of Master Wilkins's mother puts him under some confusion. So that you will excuse me, as his preceptor and friend, in making some inquiry how his affairs stand, and how his effects are disposed, as I don't doubt you have taken care to schedule everything that will be coming to him, and though he is not yet of the necessary age for taking upon himself the management of his estate, he is nevertheless of capacity to understand the nature and quantum of it, and to show his approbation of the disposition of it, as if he was a year or two older. During this discourse, Mr. G. turned pale, then reddened, was going to interrupt, then checked himself, but, however, kept silence till my master had done, when, with a sneer, he replied, Sir, I must own myself a great stranger to your discourse, nor can I, for my life, imagine what your harangue tends to. But sure I am, I know of no estate, real or personal, or anything else belonging to young Mr. Wilkins, to make a schedule of, as you call it. But this I know, his mother had an estate in land near two hundred a year, and also a good sum of money when I married her. But the estate she settled on me before her marriage, to dispose of after her decease, as I saw fit, and her money and goods are all come to my sole use as her husband. I was just ready to drop when Mr. G. gave this relation and was not able to reply a word. But my master, though sufficiently shocked at what he had heard, replied, Sir, I am informed the estate, and also the money you mention, was Mr. Wilkins' father's at his death, and I am surprised to think any one should have a better title to them than my pupil, his only child. Sir, says Mr. G., you are deceived, and though what you say seems plausible enough, and is in some part true, as the late Mr. Wilkins had such a state, and some hundreds, I may say thousands, at his death, yet you seem ignorant that he made a deed just before entering into the fatal rebellion by which he gave my late wife both the estate, money, and everything else he had absolutely, without any conditions whatsoever. All which, on his unhappy execution, she enjoyed, and now of right, as I told you before, belongs to me. However, as I have no child, if Peter behaves well under your direction, I have thoughts of paying another year's board for him, and then he must shift for himself. Oh, cried I, for the mercy of some savage beast to devour me! Is this what I have been cockered up for? Why was I not placed out to some laborious craft, where I might have drudged for bread in my proper station. But I fear it is too late to inquire into what is past, and must submit. My master, good man, was thunderstruck at what he had heard, and finding our business done there, we took our leaves, after Mr. G. had again repeated that if I behaved well, my preceptor should keep me another year, which was all I must expect from him and at my departure he gave me a crown-piece, which I then durst not refuse, for fear of offending my master. We made the best of our way home again to my tutors, where I stayed but a week to consider what I should do for myself. In this time he did all he could to comfort me, telling me if I would stay with him and become his usher, he would complete my learning for nothing, and allow me a salary for my trouble." but my heart was too lofty to think of becoming an usher, within so little way from mine own estate, in other hands. However, since I had not a penny of money to endeavor at recovering my right with, I told my master I would consider his proposal. 
During my stay with him, he used all methods to make me as easy as possible, and frequently moralized with so much effect that I was almost convinced I ought to submit and be content. Amongst the rest of his discourse, he endeavored to show me, one day after I had been loudly condemning my cruel fortune and saying I was born to be unhappy, that I was mistaken if I thought or imagined it was chance or accident that had been against me when I complained of fortune. For, says he, Peter, there is nothing done below but is at least foreknown, if not decreed above, and our business in life is to believe so. Not that I would have such belief make us careless, and think it to no purpose to strive, as some do, who, being persuaded that our actions are not in our own choice, but that, being pressed by an irresistible decree, we are forced to act this or that, fancy we must be necessarily happy or miserable hereafter. Or, as others, who, for fear of falling upon that shocking principle, would even deprive the Almighty of foreknowledge, lest it should consequentially amount to a decree. For, say they, what is foreknown will and must be. But I would have you act so as that, let either of these tenets be true, you may still be sure of making yourself easy and happy. And for that purpose, let me recommend to you a uniform life of justice and piety, always choosing the good rather than the bad side of every action. For this, say they what they will to the contrary, is not above the power of a reasonable being to practice. And doing so, you may without scruple say, If there is foreknowledge of my actions, or they are decreed, I then am one who is foreknown or decreed to be happy. And this, without farther speculation, you will find the only means always to keep you so. For all men, of all denominations, fully allow this happy effect to follow good actions. Again, Peter, a person acting in a vicious course, with such an opinion in his head as above, must surely be very miserable, as his very actions themselves must pronounce the decree against him. Whilst, therefore, we have not heard the decree read, you see we may easily give sentence whether it be for good or evil to us by the tenor and course of our own actions. You are not now to learn, Peter, that the crimes of the father are often punished in the children, often in the father himself, sometimes in both, and not seldom in neither, in this life. And though, at first, one should think the future punishment annexed to bad actions was sufficient, Still, it is necessary some should suffer here also, for an example to others, we being much more affected with what the eye sees than what the heart only meditates upon. Now, to bring it to our own case, your father, Peter, rose against the lawful magistrate to deprive him, it matters not that he was a bad one, of his lawful power. Your father's policy was such, and his design so well laid, as he thought, that upon any ill success to himself, he had secured his estate to go in the way of all others he could wish to have it, and sits down very well contented that, happen what would, he should bite the government in preventing the forfeiture. But, lo, his policy is as a wall of sand, blown down with a puff. For it is to you it ought, even himself being umpire, to have come, as no one would think he would prize any before you, his own child. Now, could he look from the grave, and know what passes here, and see Mr. G. in possession of all he fancied he had secured for you, what a weak and short-sighted creature would he find himself? If it be said he did not know he should have a child, then herein appears God's policy beyond man's, for he knew it, and has so ordered that that child should be disinherited. For, by the way, Peter, take this for a maxim, wherever the first principle of an action is ill, no good consequence can possibly ever be an attendant on it. Could he, as I said before, but look up and see you, his only child, undone by the very instrument he designed for your security, how pungent would be his anxiety? I say, Peter, though there is something so unaccountable to human wisdom in such events of things, Yet there is something therein so reasonable and just withal, that by a prying eye 
the supreme hand may very visibly be seen in them. Now this being plainly the case before us, and herein the glory of the Almighty exalted rest content under it, and let not this disappointment befalling you for your father's faults be attended with others sent down for your own. But remember this, the hand that depresses a man is no less able to exalt and establish him. End of chapter 3 